create the particular d dilemmas that we that that we are in is and and how we might be able to move together through this this time between worlds is uh, is is part of what makes this thinking so exciting. So I want to give everyone here also a, a chance to um, to introduce yourselves to each other. And so we're going to break into uh, groups of groups of three. And I invite you to uh, to say hello, to meet each other, find out where you're from, and what drew you to this evening with Zach. Nadia, are you are you set up? Yeah, we can start. Have a good dialogue. Welcome back. Good to see you back again. And uh, I hope you had a, had a nice contact with a, with a few of few of the attendees here. And again, um, we're going to uh, we, we want we want to take this take this time that we have this evening for for a, a deep dialogue. A, a an an educational opportunity in itself to actually be together here to be present with each other to be in dialogue and not in debate and discussion and that takes a willingness to 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 listen to listen deeply and an openness to that which we don't already know. And I invite, invite you, a couple of you, if you would like to share why you're here. That might be nice for Zach and myself to know, to hear from you what you shared in your in your small groups. Because this this dialogue evening is about engagement. It's about dialogue. Zach is 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 bringing his knowledge and 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 wisdom as an impulse into into the the collective here and it's it's our engagement with it that will create this this event so anyone like to share you can unmute yourself because i'm here because your interview with zach was so interesting and i read it this morning and i thought okay this is my friday evening mm -hmm. i want to know more about it Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Claudia. I'd like to second that, um, Elizabeth, um, not only the interview, which was wonderful. I mean, I've been following Zach's work for at least three or four years in different spheres, but the fact that you asked for this gathering to be of this nature of inviting dialogue and the three hours and be participatory, I think starts to prefigure precisely what Zach has been talking about, mm -hmm. you know, in this sense of mutual learning. So thank you, Elizabeth, mm -hmm. and thank you, Zach. Mm 
for being here. Thank you. I'll jump in and say that um, thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you, Zach, for, for meeting with us. I've been a fan of Zach's for many years. I listen to him and read him a lot, and I've learned a lot. And um, something came up for me in our in our small group. I work a lot with parents who have no idea what to do with their young people. And it's it's hard, you know, and I'm only touching a fragment of that population. So I'm noticing, like, you know, I, I wanted like 5,000 people to be on this call <laughs> because so part of what we're looking at, which is so much a part of the meta crisis, is like the turning away mm -hmm. and not really showing up and noticing that our young people are in trouble. And that we're so, there's such a, a disconnection. And um, yeah, so I just, I, I feel like that's part of what needs to be integrated. And I'm, I'm looking forward to exploring that right. together. Thanks, Shayla. If I could just, um jump in and add to what Shayla was speaking to about a wish for a thousand people to be on this call mm -hmm. um, and about integration. I, I did share in my small group breakout session that I was given this invitation through a friend who knows or someone who knows Elizabeth, but I'm not familiar with either you, Elizabeth, or, or with Zach. But I, I am involved in this um, in the states with um, a turning of uh, in healing centered education, you know, very much with an eye for what is being called for in the future to heal the divides that um, we we have certainly been, I think, exponentially growing in many dimensions. Um, so I came here with a with a curiosity because um, in reading the description, I um, had a sense that um, following the events of 2020, as I've been seeing myself showing up in spaces that are either predominantly diverse or predominantly white, that I continue to lean into this curiosity of how is it that these global issues and um, the meta impacts of what we have designed so far is continuing to have uh, the separation mm -hmm. show up in in these in these conversations that are are necessarily needing to, to be integrated. So that's why I'm I'm here with the curiosity of yeah. of who is here and and how are we using language in, in talking about issues that actually do impact everyone, but everyone's not actually in the same dialogue. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Joy. I think you're, you're touching on something that's, I think, very important to what we want to do with this evening, and that is to really find, to really start from, from a recognition that there, that, that there is something that holds us together. And you could say for this evening, it is a shared intention to learn or to find something out in relationship to education in the future. But that also speaks to a, often a deeper longing and a deeper connection, but that we are here together. And, and we are, each of us, uh, different. And how can we synergize those two? How can the fact that we are humans together facing uh, a metacrisis, which is something you can say as a word, as a, as a concept, but what it means is actually quite, uh, quite stark. Um, how can we bring our shared experience and understanding together and, and create something? And if we can do a little bit of that tonight, that would be, that would be, Wonderful, because the nature of dialogue is is about that which comes through, the word coming through, 
the word being being an intelligence that is something that we that we share and can we can we lean into uh, a shared field of of interest of curiosity and in that work together to to think together if we can do some good thinking together tonight that will be uh, a very positive thing And Nadia, I, I think I think let's let's. I mean, I, I'd like to invite you to to listen deeply. Um, I'd like to invite you to bring your full curiosity present here, your full presence also to this this conversation, and and in the dialogical part parts we the way this will work is that Zach and I are going about to start a, a conversation and we will invite you to join that conversation and to continue to to work what it is that we're working together um, and then you'll have we'll have small groups for about 45 minutes and in those small groups we invite you to, to really we'll give we'll we'll toss in a question um and invite you to to engage with it and then we'll come back with with zach and we'll all have an integration round we'll in, see if we can integrate some of the things that that came up in your in your small groups so um that's that that's that's the plan and i invite you in in dialogue again to recognize that we are we are sharing something here and to share our con to be more interested in that which we don't already know than the things that we have slots for and can just check off and that leaning in with that open curiosity is what can make something uh, powerful happen between us so uh, Nadia maybe you want to pin uh, me and Zach and we'll we'll start we'll start our our part of the dialogue and then we'll we'll bring you all back back in in uh in a short while you are already pinned oh you i am okay. might have to change to speaker's view okay thank you all right okay no it's okay all i see is is you Nadia? Okay. And Zach? Wait a moment. Okay. Here we go. There we are. Okay. Hi, Zach. Hey, Elizabeth. So welcome. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. So we, uh, I, I thought, I think it might be interesting to just start with something really basic. Like when we talk about edu education, what do you, what do you mean? What is education? Right. Yeah, it's actually a much, I think, deeper question than most people realize. Um, uh, if you go to a graduate school of education, you mostly study schooling. Mm -hmm. right? So the, the people in the discipline of the field of education are primarily concerned with schools. Um, and so there's been a long standing conflation during modernity and now post modernity of education with schooling. Um, and so that's the first thing. It's like, well, education is different from schooling. <laughs> right. Uh, and then education is different from learning, although education involves learning. But there's a lot of learning that can take place out of quote unquote educational contexts. You know, you can go into the woods by yourself and uh, 
learn, teach yourself to build a shelter, for example, if you wanted to, uh, or you could um, explore a neighborhood in an urban area by yourself. Uh, and learn its in and outs. No one's telling you how it works. <laughs> there's no teacherly authority. There's no curriculum, but you're learning, right? So there's also been a conflation there, which is painful for children who conflate education and schooling and learning together. And then their displeasure with schools has them discount learning and education. So they just <laughs> kind of, so if we have to uncouple these concepts, we have to uncouple these concepts and we have to make it clear that learning and education actually need to take place more now outside of schools than they ever have. And that we're witnessing something, I believe, like the end of schools during an educational renaissance, if it goes well. <laughs> we could also be witnessing the end of schools during a kind of planetary triumph of propaganda. We could also witness that. <laughs> That's another conversation. But by education, I mean something actually, uh, a very anthropologically deep-seated species specific trait so that's a thick concept right there but what that means is that education is actually one of the things that makes us human mm -hmm. which is to say as distinct from others in the animal kingdom there's been long arguments well it's no it's technologies that make us distinct or you know, it's language that makes us distinct right or it's some like a soul or something that makes us distinct all interesting uh, but I'm following here actually the work of Michael Tomasello who's at the Max Planck Institute. Uh, and he has this fascinating argument. He's done all of this work in comparative psychology where you actually look at monkeys and humans and specifically young humans. And you try to tease out like, what is actually the difference here? Like we share so much genetically <laughs> and so much actually neurologically in terms of especially the limbic system with primates. So this question of what is, is there a difference? <laughs> what is it? It's a complex question. And he says, probably the most profound difference and the things that actually are the condition for the possibility for things like language and technology and other things people claim make us distinct is what he calls a joint attentional situation. Mm -hmm. um, and this is when you and I both share attention about something else, right? Like, so it's me and you in this thing. Uh, and um, other animals don't share joint attention with nearly the robustness that humans do. And it doesn't become as much a part of their like needs and social structures. Um, some hunting animals show some signs of this. Some domesticated animals through interaction with human can do this, like your dog. Um, but when you do observations of primates in the wild, um, you get a different kind of phenomenon that doesn't look like what we would call education. It doesn't look like a sustained joint attentional situation between elder and youth about a third object, <laughs> uh, which the elder knows more about than the youth, right? Mm -hmm. So like the idea that the construction of something like a unit for raising the young <laughs> involving joint attentional situation uh, is this um, species specific trait, something mm -hmm. very unique. It allows us to be the niche adapting, culture creating, language using, technology innovating animal mm -hmm. uh, is our ability to actually create cultural ratchet effects and pass on through intergenerational transmission, really complex <laughs> things. Um, and that's all on this capacity for joint attention, me and you in this third object, or me and you in this idea, or me and you in this story, all of the capacity we have to be together in front of something and know that we're together and hold that third thing and each other in relation to it. And so at its most primordial, education is that, and that allows a social system to reproduce itself. It allows us to recreate our cultures, recreate our societies. So sometimes I talk about education as social autopoiesis, mm -hmm. which is to say the autopoiesis is a Greek word that's been used by biologists. It means like the self-writing, mm -hmm. uh, the self-maintaining. So it's the work that the organism does to keep being itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like your metabolism is the most basic thing, you know? Um, like all my cells, except a few brain cells, 
are different than they were, let's say 10 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. There's a work that my body does to maintain being itself. Um, and so education similarly is the poetic function of a social system that allows the system to be itself, to evolve or to not evolve, <laughs> but to pass on certain social functions that are essential for it to be itself. So if you think about just the process of growth and aging and dying, <laughs> you know, as the adult comes into adulthood, they take on necessary social functions. As they pass away, those social functions need to be taken over by the youth. Mm. Right? How does that transfer of institutional and social and cultural responsibility take place? That's the recreation of the society through intergenerational transmission mm -hmm. in the context of these dynamics of teacherly authority in the joint attentional situation. Mm. Right? So that was, <laughs> that's the mouthful of like a very abstract definition of education which we have to uncouple from schooling right now so profoundly because the schools are failing us, just like many of our most basic institutions are failing us mm. you know, or are radically, radically fragile. Yeah. So that means we have to think from first principles about how to innovate in education between worlds when we can't rely on schools and legacy institutions. We have to think about at a very basic level, what is this thing? How can we protect it to protect the young Right, to assure that we can actually exist together mm. in the future. Mm. That there won't be essential lot knowledge lost or essential personality structures or emotional dispositions and all of these things that we get through this process of intergenerational transmission. Yeah, I, I love that concept of intergenerational transmission. And I think it's it's incredibly important. And I think it's part of what uh, anyone who's who's working with with young people and gets or anyone who's looking at the world right now and and wondering where it's, where we're going kind of gets at a gut level that there's something failing in between the generations at, at this point and uh you speak about and have written about a time between worlds that we are at the end end of something and not the begin and and that will end up being the beginning of something else but where there's a space in between and that space in between is is this time of in some ways of failure of of intergenerational transmission that that how it is that we that we pass on culture knowledge uh rectitude you know um morals the good the true the beautiful is is not uh it's it's not happening and there's there's movements to try to go back, try to go back and and recreate more traditional contexts, and 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 there is the, the the desire to move forward, but not knowing how. Um, can you speak more to to this process of intergener and intergenerational transmission and what where how do you under, how do you understand that we will that we what, what do we need to do in order to 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 transform this again yeah so yeah you're that's one of the ways to think about what it means to be between worlds or world systems or um is the idea that there's there's been a disruption of intergenerational transmission and you can you can call it a failure, but in, in some sense, it's an inevitable disruption, I think, as a result of technology and the advancement of capitalism, basically. Uh, like there was uh, in the past, this would happen. So if you think about, okay, right now we've handled for, let's say, I don't know, 400 years, 600 years, education in these huge bureaucratized public schools for the most part in the West. like, And then we exported those all over the world. That's what we thought of as education. But you can rewind <laughs> before there were schools, period, before there's anything like schools. And then you're looking at educational systems, which don't involve schooling. Um, and the if you have an educational system, let's say, in the types of societies that David Graeber's writing about um, way before schooling, um, and there is an ecological occurrence around that society and that society has to migrate to another part of the continent that they reside on. Um, they would be between worlds mm. because the knowledge that the elders had 
about their local environment that allowed them to survive for all those years and the rhythms of the seasons and the different opportunities for farming uh, and other things would be so different, you know, presumably 600 miles away after maybe a year of walking, right? Until you found a place where there weren't competitive and you could set up shop again. So there were times in the past when we had what Margaret Mead would call prefigurative cultures. When the elders were in a position to not really, able, they can't really say what it's going to be like, kids. <laughs> like, I can tell you what it was like for us back there, <laughs> but everything's changed now and we're entering a new world. We're not even there yet. We may, I might not see that world, kid. <laughs> You're going to have to go live in that world. And I don't know exactly what to tell you. So that's not an unprecedented situation, but it what used to be a rare situation and a non-prolonged situation, which is to say like it would be a, a generation or two, and then you'd be in what you would, what Margaret Mead would call a post-figurative culture, again, where you would do what your grandfather did, what your father did, right? Um, there was a, just a very clear sense of intergenerational transmission. You're in a world. We know how the world works, <laughs> right? The elders can tell the youth, hey, here's how the world works, kid. <laughs> uh, but Again, if you're forced out of that world, there's a period of, there's a liminal space where intergenerational transmission is radically disrupted. And then with modernity, hypermodernity, hypercapitalist expansion, you end up getting basically a perpetual deworlding, mm -hmm. a profit seeking strategy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like we're, we're cooking in to the process of our civilization, continual cultural deworlding. It's a very complex thing to say, but what it means is we're messing with the dynamics of intergenerational transmission mm -hmm. almost intentionally. Um, and so we've reached a point of a crisis of teacherly authority, mm -hmm. right? which is to say, it is not clear where one can look for legitimate teacherly authority. It's mm -hmm. a huge problem. <laughs> it's a problem that has a source in the fact that modernity degraded <laughs> the legitimacy of teacherly authority <laughs> through over bureaucratizing it, through commodifying the teacher student relationship, um, through the reductive human capital theory that reduced education to job training and therefore made your teacher just kind of complicit in this whole capitalist scheme to kind of like extract profit from you. <laughs> so there's a reason we're skeptical and there's a reason why the youth look at people claiming teacherly authority like me <laughs> and they're like, screw you. <laughs> Right? Like you're working on the back of what all these elders did to get us into the situation where we're all about to die. Right? Uh -huh. So we confront this situation where there's a general sense of cynicism and uh, almost a kind of generational warfare instead of intergenerational transmission. Mm. And the, the last generation environmental group. Mm, right. right. Yeah. That's what it comes to. Well, and the economic inequality. I mean, it's like, some Marxists argued long ago that eventually class warfare would be sublimated into generational warfare. Mm. Um, and if you look, especially in the United States, at the behavior, the behavior of the baby boomers vis-a-vis -vis mm -hmm. <laughs> Gen X, Gen Y, and Z, you see basically generations that were systematically put into debt um, and into a situation of never being able to reach the economic attainments that their baby boomer parents and grandparents had. Uh, so it's a very complex situation. And if you look at cryptocurrency, <laughs> uh, guess who owns most cryptocurrency? Not boomers. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> right. So at the level of basic currencies and economic bases, we're seeing intergenerational like pulling away. Um, and uh, again, also, if you look at like Greta, um, you yeah. know, and other elements of uh, youth activism, you're, you're seeing this dynamic. And mm -hmm. One of the issues is that, um, you know, there is a sense of failure. Like, because what happens when you are in a time between worlds and when you're the elder who knows your knowledge is no longer gonna be as valuable as it used to be. And maybe like, it's your fault you got into a war or you actually destroyed the environment and then had to leave the environment, <laughs> right? Now you're in a situation of feeling like a failed being who actually has nothing to teach the youth. Right. So it's, it's those two. It's not just the youth saying, hey, I don't trust you. Uh, it's also the elders saying, I actually really screwed up and don't feel wise and have nothing to teach you. <laughs> uh, who am I to tell you what to do? Right. I messed up. Um, and so they relinquish the responsibility 
of teacherly authority, right? which is also what we're saying. We're saying the, the don't be a teacher because I don't trust any teachers. And we're saying like, I have no aspiration to be a teacher. I relinquish responsibility for the next generation. Mm -hmm. They are on their own. Both of those lead to this breakdown of educational dynamics in the society, which means that the society is gonna grind to a halt because <laughs> it can't do the work of reproducing itself anymore. Mm -hmm. We literally will have what Habermas called in 72, he saw it coming, a legitimation crisis and a capabilities crisis, mm -hmm. which means for example, like we have nuclear reactors. Um, you need a certain number of people with PhDs in nuclear physics to run nuclear reactors. Which means like if we screw up the education system so bad that we can't create PhDs, it, right? This is just a simple example that we can't create enough people to man these massively complex, complex technologies we've wedded ourselves to for thousands of years in the case of nuclear. <laughs> uh, then we literally are in a situation where just from a capabilities crisis standpoint, we haven't reproduced the capabilities we need mm -hmm. to keep this thing going, which is the most basic breakdown, which is like, oh, we've got these complex structures. Uh, and no one knows how to fix them anymore <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because no one wanted to listen to the last, you know, grandpa or grandma or whoever it was who had the information that was enough to teach it, but no one. And now, because we took it for granted that this thing always worked <laughs> and now we don't know how to fix it. We don't know what to do. And, and there's, it's very hard to get out of that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's a, it's a basic dynamic of civilizational collapse, which you mm -hmm. see in prior civilizations, um, but they didn't have as dangerous machines to break. Right. Uh, when a nuclear reactor breaks, that's an existential problem. Uh, but, but you you have been writing, uh, or you wrote recently about uh, a, uh, an educator named Comenius, who 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 was a a, a a futurist in before the the early modern period, and and you wrote about him as an example for us. Can you can you say more why what does what does this example an example of a failure of intergenerational transition a a it, the last time around in in the West uh, and and what it is that he did that we can learn from yeah um, always got to kind of bring the spirit of John Amos Comenius in the room if you're if you're having a conversation about education, although he's not widely known. He, yeah, a 17th century um, educational philosopher from the region of Bohemia, which we would now call like the Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, this paper I wrote basically argues that the time that Comenius lived in, uh, the end of the long 16th century, the beginning of the 30 years war, well, the beginning and the end of the 30 years war, uh, the circuitous route between the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. Um, the Enlightenment, let's say 1660 something, when the Royal Academy is founded in England, uh, that was basically Comenius's idea, the Royal Academy. <laughs> uh, Leibniz and Descartes, and many of the huge names we associate with the Western Enlightenment um, were basically massive supporters of Comenius who became a refugee from the 30 years war and traveled to the different royal courts in Europe, everyone wanting him to basically reform their educational systems. The main reason being that he found a way to make the printing press create educational artifacts instead of propaganda. <laughs> That's like the main thing that happened. Um, and the other thing that happened was that he was seeing the need for a fundamental change at the level of how the society reproduces itself. He argued that because the ancient regime is ending, because the divine right of kings will be questioned ultimately, <laughs> because we're figuring out distribution and supply issues and we have the printing press, we need what we would now call public schools. So, and these are ideas that made people's like brains come out of their ears in the 1600s, right? He's saying like every person, regardless of race, regardless of creed, regardless of where you come from, your gender, like he's saying, ed educate everyone. His slogan was, teach all things to all people in all ways, right? Mm -hmm. And he was a developmentalist and a biomimicry guy. He looked at how nature worked and he said, nature has these propensities and we have these propensities. And he brought it in with Neoplatonism and he made a system that he called pan which means universal wisdom. And it was 
uh, you know, arguably one of the most profound philosophical systems ever created, uh, mm. at least in Europe, you know. Um, and uh, so, but the main point with Aeneas and the comparison that you're drawing to is actually the fact that that period, the 16th century, the 30 years war, this was a time between worlds. This was arguably the first world war. Like the 30 years war people, at least in the United States history, you don't learn very much about the 30 years war, mm -hmm. but it was massively catastrophic. Mm -hmm. Something like 20 or 30% of the population died um, mm -hmm. of that, of the region that Comenius fled. Um, and it was a time of literally printing press enabled propaganda catalyzed polarization. Mm -hmm. Which is the one? same situation we're in right, right. now. Right. Does that sound familiar? A new tech, a yeah. new technology comes, which is the printing press, right? Um, and they're able to literally, like, besiege whole cities with pamphlets and posters uh, and other things. Um, and it was the Protestants versus the Catholics, right? This is the, this mm -hmm. is the thing. And Thirty Years' War. Mm -hmm. Right, the Thirty Years' War. And so hell, specifically, became an object of propaganda um, work. So the idea was being like, oh, if if the hell you go to by not being a Catholic is worse than the hell you go to by not being a Protestant, mm -hmm. then you better be a Catholic. So there was literally a, a, an arms race mm -hmm. in propagandistic visions of hell as part of the deepening the polarization and picking needing to pick a side. Mm -hmm. um, and this is why the Christian notion of hell became so traumatizing mm -hmm. <laughs> for Christians. It didn't exist in the way that it came to exist. Um, so that's an example of this propaganda campaigns that occurred in the 1600s still affecting us today mm -hmm. by virtue of reality distortion and limbic hijacking uh, and essentially scapegoat dynamic created between in-groups and out-groups. Um, and so communities was basically saying, mm -hmm. we actually need to use the same techniques which is like pictures coupled with text uh, in Latin and in your native language and to make it possible. <clears throat> Same techniques to teach people to reason, <laughs> to mm -hmm. teach people to think about the world in a complex way. And so he made a series of books that became the most popular books in Europe for 400 years. Mm -hmm. Understand that, 400 wow. years. These things were reprinted until the 1800s. And they were used, they weren't reprinted as novelties, they were used. The Orbis Pictus, uh, which is basically the kind of pictures of the world. And it's arguably the first kid's book, but it's, I wouldn't say it's a kid's book because it's got images of witcher, witch, witches being tortured and stuff like that. <laughs> but mm -hmm. it, it shows pictures of all the things that were occurring and it's annotated and it teaches you Latin and it teaches you words. And it became the canonical book uh, that was translated into Russian and Chinese and Arabic and mm -hmm. like literally it was a worldwide phenomenon in the 1600s. Um, and uh, so he had solved that problem of, okay, you guys are using this to make propaganda. We actually need to use this to make education and we need to use it to make education for everyone, not just us, yeah. <laughs> not just the people who look like us, but, but everybody. Uh, and the sad truth is that although many of the key players in what we now call like the modern enlightenment were huge Comenius fans. They basically took what they wanted from him. And then by the time he died, his reputation, something had happened to his reputation because he was a very religious and mystical man. Right. So the idea was that basically as modernity became secular, Comenius became taboo. Mm. Uh, so they took the idea of the public school system. They took the idea, many of the ideas of what we call the modern university system, uh, especially the scientific kind of like research institutes um, and other ideas, uh, age specific grades and curriculum, it's convenient. <laughs> uh, the mother and the mothering one, if you will, as the locus of education. Like many of these core ideas were eventually appropriated, but his deeper ideas, which touch on the notion of Bildung, which of mm. course etymologically means in the image of God, mm. his deeper ideas had to do with a, um, you know, this invisible college he was building with the Rosicrucians with mm -hmm. the intention of essentially, um, you know, enlightening uh, humans, redeeming mm -hmm. them from the fallen state and ushering in the, the utopia, like the utopia millennia, 
<laughs> if you will. And so by the time science really got going, they're like, mm, let's forget that part of Comenius. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These other parts are much uh, more interesting. But his involvement with the Rosicrucian Invisible College, again, he was key there. Many think many people think he was actually at the core of what we call modern Freemasonry. Mm -hmm. So his influence was deep, pervasive. Um, uh, and that article just like touches the surface. Yeah. Because again, I said his, I tell a story about Comenius. I don't actually discuss his philosophy, which I said is actually one of the most profound Neoplatonic syntheses um, that exists. Uh, so, so that's a little bit on Comenius, but the main point we're trying to make is that there have been periods in history where we've been deworlded before, right? We can be deworlded. We move between these uh, civilizational epochs. And the key thing to do during that time, this is the Comenius move, is to ed innovate educationally, because the, the key problem is that we're disrupting intergenerational transmission. So the key mm -hmm. thing we actually need to solve is how to restore intergenerational transmission and basically like revivify the image of the human. Because as the world goes away, what it means to be human goes away. Mm. Right? So, But, but it's, it's also, I mean, it's interesting because part of the things that you're pointing to that Cominius or that, that came, it may not have been his, his work per se, but that came out after, as a result of his his work, uh, the schools, etc., are the things that are actually in question today, exactly. and that are 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 being turned over or need to be turned over. And I I uh, I wonder also if if that choice in terms of secularization to create a, a world that is purely purely secular um, that that separating uh, the divine, if you will, from from the, the mundane and saying the mundane's where in some ways the mundane is is uh, is the universal. Um, would they wouldn't have put it that way? <laughs> but is is uh, part of what it what it seems to be the legacy of that of that time is is that we have been uh, I think almost desold in the process of of modernization mechanization instrumentality um this way that 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 th these ideas that went into modern schooling have have played themselves out over the last few hundred years yeah it's hard to deny um but it's also hard to deny that the regime it replaced, which is to say the so-called ancient regime of mm. the aristocracies and the divine right of kings and the feudal system. Um, that, was better. <laughs> well, it's just, it's very like history is better or worse. It's like, yeah. there's, a, there's something that occurs that uh, like kind of is the winds of history. So right, when the Dutch East India company, company emerged, right? It was the equivalent of what like Facebook and Google are right now. Mm -hmm. like, if you compare the Dutch East India Company in terms of its modes of operation, it used the printing press to perfect bureaucracy, right? Which means that they were moving at a level that was just like incomprehensible to the feudal lords. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, when they arrived in India, it was, it was, it was, you know, more or less game over for a long time. But then you get the Bengal Renaissance, and that's a whole thing that's actually very interesting there. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, which is where the Indians were like, Oh, this is child's play, we can do this too. And then the Indians picked it up, and then we get eventually Aurobindo and Gandhi. And so mm -hmm. you get that story. But it begins with the Dutch East India Company being like exponentially different from the feudal system in the way that Google and Facebook are exponentially different from the forms of modernity and capitalism we've known. And this is what I'm trying to say like, we're, we're between worlds. Mm -hmm. If you think you know where you are and what those organizations are, then you're actually living in an old world <laughs> that doesn't doesn't have reality anymore. These things are are unprecedented um, and uh, directly coupled to the question of education. Interestingly enough, especially a company like Facebook, um, which is a you know it's an organization that billions of people belong to it. So it's got more people belong to Facebook than belong to any country, and it is basically a customized behavioral modification engine. That's right, so what it does. Mm -hmm. it tells you that it's allowing you to social network and stuff, but what it's actually doing is systematically monitoring your behavior in order to manipulate it. Mm -hmm. So that's unprecedented. Uh, and so it's uh, we're in a situation where we need to 
recognize that we're being deworlded by a new form of organization and technology, which is the digital. Mm -hmm. And we need to respond to that. <clears throat> and so, uh, yeah, please. So what do you, what do you, you, what, what does the future of education look like? Yeah. Um, so I usually talk about five things and I'll just list them and then we can, we've already touched on some of them. Um, so one is that uh, the future of education is now irreversibly planetary. And that involves both in terms of notions of identity and in terms of planetary boundaries, which is mm -hmm. to say like, we're approaching planetary boundaries, warning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like we need an educational system that keeps our civilization uh, sustainable within planetary boundaries, which means bringing all people into awareness of the planet, right? And of, so I'm not talking about globalization, mm -hmm. uh, which is part of the problem we're overcoming in many ways. I'm talking about planetization, which is what Orbindo and Tilliard wrote about, which was an inevitable result of the flourishing of the human species, mm -hmm. right? We're on a sphere, which means if we multiply and spread out, we'll bump into one another. Mm -hmm. <laughs> If we were on an endless plane, which is a weird thought experiment, but if we were on an endless, endless, then we would just spread forever. We'd never be forced into this in internal internalization. So planetization, planetary, future of education is planetary. And, uh, and you, you, you mentioned that that's also part of an identity shift. It is, we're, yes. We're, we're not just, I'm not just belonging to this little island here or this little region. Correct. I'm, I'm part of something Well, there would that, be a... So what Michael, Michelle Bowens calls like a cosmo localism. Mm -hmm. So the idea would be essentially like, well, you are part of a region actually, and it's more important than ever than now that you know the specifics of that region, but you are fundamentally with everybody on this planet. Right. Um, and so those two different from saying, Hey, you're in this region, but you're fundamentally an American full yeah. stop. <laughs> That's yeah. the main difference is that our educational systems we've known and loved, like I, I, I say bad things about schools, but of course I've benefited from schools, right? Um, and we all have. The, the point isn't that they're evil; it's that they're they're like dinosaurs, like they're going extinct. Um, but the uh, yeah, so those schools were built around nationalism, like period. Mm -hmm. The nation state conspired with capitalism to build the public schools. Right. In, in the United States, it was like bald faced. <laughs> like when you look at the involvement of philanthropy with the federal government in building these things. Uh, Coca-Cola. Yeah, for American citizens, right? So I'm saying we need to build actually more bigger, more complex educational systems that don't look like schools that are actually planetary centric. Um, and uh, so that's the first one, planetary. Uh, the second one is high tech. Uh, whether we like it or not, and especially educators who are good teachers and work with young kids want to say, let's just keep the technology out of education. But that, sh that train has left the station. <laughs> like with the emergence of the smartphone in every adolescent's hand, um, uh, something fundamentally changed. And AI in specific, artificial intelligence, uh, fundamentally changes the game for education mm -hmm. in at least two ways. One is large scale structural unemployment as a result of automation. Mm -hmm. This is the one everyone sees, right? Which is basically, oh, schools are built to teach you to be a laborer mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and to enter the wage labor system. Uh, but what if the wage labor system is so fundamentally different now because 85% of jobs can be done better by AIs. Um, and this seems like a crazy science fiction scenario, but it's coming faster than you think. Uh, and there's work to actually try to slow it down. And some of the people involved think we should just create jobs that people don't need to do just to give people jobs, <laughs> which is a little bit already happening if you read mm -hmm. David Graeber's work on bullshit jobs. Mm -hmm. But the idea that there would be large scale structural unemployment as a result of AI that so profoundly affects the way value is contributed to society that we actually need to rethink, you know, what does it mean to be a human if you're not a wage laborer? Like, right. What does it mean to be in an educational system if the end point of that educational system is not to put you in a position of having to be a wage laborer? Mm -hmm. Like, that's like a, huh? Yeah. <laughs> like, what does that mean? And again, it's, we've gotten so used to schooling and we've gotten so used to wage labor Right. that we think that's what humans are, but most of human history, 
yeah. does not involve not. school wage labor. So this right. question of what does it mean to be human that's not a wage labor, we can answer that question. Mm -hmm. But again, capitalism can't imagine its own infinity and capitalism can't imagine its own end. So that means it's running some kind of strange program. So you've got AI, automated unemployment, human capital theory of schooling debunked. You're not going to go get a job, kid. Schooling's about something else. Education's about something else. What's it about? The second one is that uh, we're going to get AI-driven tutoring systems. We're going to get AI-driven tutoring systems in virtual reality. Right. So now that sounds like Star Trek, and it is. Mm -hmm. um, we have GPT-3 from an organization known as OpenAI, which can right now, you can feed it all of Thomas Jefferson's letters or anyone's letters and writings, and then ask it questions, and it'll respond as if it's Thomas Jefferson or whoever you fed mm. it, very convincingly, mm. very convincingly. Um, so now imagine like GPT-7, which is like mm. not just kind of convincing, but like really convincing. And then embed GPT-7 in a, you know, convincing avatar of Thomas Jefferson in virtual reality. And now you're a kid talking to Thomas Jefferson. Cool. Right? <laughs> kind of, in one way, really cool. And another way, really, really, really scary. Scary. <laughs> so this question of, if you remember what education, the definition, uh, you know, joint attentional situation between two humans and something, right? Yeah. Engaging the Thomas Jefferson avatar in virtual reality is not a situation of teacherly authority, right? Mm -hmm. Thomas Jefferson's not teaching you. In fact, Thomas Jefferson's teaching you more if you read his letter or his book, mm -hmm. right? But this is a mix mash semantic analysis, like deep learning algorithm run on the content of Jefferson's writing, giving you completely unique novel answers to unique questions, which is may or may not be what Thomas Jefferson would say, right? So it's very important. It's like, there's a simulation here that we could get trapped in and we could start learning from AIs as if they're people. Um, mm -hmm. And then we would obsolete teaching. So the question is, is teaching one of those professions which will be obsoleted by, by AI automation, mm -hmm. right? If you were running charter schools for, pro for profit, your answer is hopefully yes, right? Mm -hmm. Because the best way to make profit <laughs> is to get human labor out of the equation and to automate it as fast as you can. So there's a huge venture capital push to obsolete teachers and to bring AIs in instead of them. Um, and AI technology is the most rapidly advancing technology in the world right now. There's an arms race. There's an arms race between basically China and the US to get AI. <clears throat> Uh, and there's a lot of transhumanists and technologists who have faith that the AI will actually be smarter than better than humans mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and that teachers are flawed and that the AI Thomas Jefferson would teach history better. Um, uh, so, so that's the second place where AI comes in. So we as educators think about the future of education have to deal with both the kind of job markets, AI automation, kind of what is the human if not a wage labor question? And what do we do with these AI tutoring systems which are gonna become massively uh, convincing and massively powerful? Uh, and what's the right way to conceive that? How do we harness that potential, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's the second one. The third one is risk, existential and catastrophic risks specifically. Um, and these go with the prior two. As soon as you get a planetary civilization and it's a high tech civilization, then you have the technologies to destroy that civilization, which is like this strange Fermi's paradox, it's called, <laughs> right? There's a bottleneck. Uh, or Bindo said, when we reach planetization, there's a race between heaven and hell. Mm. Um, and so that means that ever since World War II, humans have needed to live with an awareness of existential risk, that we could have a self-induced species extinction event. Uh, and it could be a mistake. It could just be a technical error. <laughs> uh, different from the apocalypse. We've always had the apocalypse, right? But the apocalypse is a morally ordered event. The apocalypse is actually God coming down and kind of making everything make sense. <laughs> like it's the end, but it's not a meaningless end due to massive technological violence as a result of our own creation. Uh, and so X risk is a very specific thing. And for a little bit after the war, like people like Robert J. Lifton and others who are psychologists, like put this on the public radar. And then we just were like trying to forget about it. 
Like, let's mm -hmm. not, let's actually not think about the mm -hmm. fact that we could all die at any minute from a nuclear war. Um, interestingly enough, now we're thinking about that again. It's a whole other yeah. topic, but I don't actually think we're thinking about it as clearly as we need to, but that's another mm -hmm. question. Um, but the point being education and so nuclear, but then there's climate change. That's another existential risk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and there's, there's way more than you would like me to list. Um, and they all interact with one another to make the future really risky, like mm -hmm. profoundly, definitionally risky. Um, and uh, the, how do we know as elders what to explain to children when about that fact? Mm -hmm. um, so the most obvious example of this from a curriculum standpoint is um, climate change, right? Uh, there's a lot of climate change curriculum that actually is designed to make, feel, make kids feel guilt and sorrow at the loss of the environment, right? Um, okay, I can see why you might wanna do that, but I could also see why you might not wanna do that, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And so the question is, how do we have conversations about this, uh, this, these topics of existential risk, which is the end of everything, but then there's catastrophic risk. Catastrophic risk is just where 10 or 15% of the population die, like the 30 years war. It was catastrophic in a technical sense. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's hard to talk about too. Um, and we had to experience fearing having those conversations with the youth as COVID began, right? Mm -hmm. The fear of having to have the conversation about when billions watch, millions die. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing they can do about it. So that future that's inherently risky and catastrophic uh, is also tragic. And so I talk about the need for the future of education to be post-tragic in terms of its orientation in psychology. This gets into my work as a psychologist. I'm not gonna unpack all that, but basically it means, you know, there are different ways to relate to tragedy. Tragedy is inevitable, full stop. If you believe tragedy is not inevitable, then you're in the pre-tragic pre station <laughs> of consciousness, right? We're also we're we're mortal. <laughs> yeah, it, well, yeah, people die. That's the simplest way to think about it. Um, and this is again, work done at the Center for Interval Wisdom with Gaffney and Wilbur for years using this model of thinking about like, how do you basically move through the pre-tragic denial of tragedy and step into tragedy, right? Mm -hmm. And actually realize how that it's a tragedy, right? And then you can get stuck in the tragic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can just iterate on tragedy and do shadow work endlessly, mm -hmm. basically. So there's this question of how do you go to the post-tragic which is not a not it's not a new denial of tragedy it's actually being in the tragedy still right but having also found a way to manage and transcend the tragedy phenomenologically psychologically mm. emotionally in terms of soul depth and mm. grasp um, so you know pre-tragic you're laughing all the time and there's love right during the tragedy it's very hard to laugh <laughs> and very hard to love right in the post-tragic there's laughter and love again, but it's mm -hmm. different than the pre-tragic laughter and love, right? So that's a simple characterization, but as educators, thinking about this dynamic of intergenerational transmission, like what's the orientation we bring emotionally to the world, right? Do we, are we basically lying to our kids and giving them a pre-tragic view, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Are we traumatizing them by getting them stuck in the tragic and telling them there's no way out of the tragic? <laughs> Or do we have some way to actually mature ourselves enough to become post-tragic to know the right way to speak about these things? And how do we tell stories about our own history, mm -hmm. right? That are not just simply tragedies because you can really easily tell a history that's just tragedy if you want to, mm -hmm. right? And you can tell a triumphalist mm -hmm. pre-tragic history if you want to, right? So how do you actually tell a history that's post-tragic, right? Um, how do you deal with the reform of governance and all these things that we're talking about in a way that's mature enough to be um, uh, subject to intergenerational transmission. Mm -hmm. So that's the second one. And then the final one is that it's post-secular and mm -hmm. these two are related, right? And I use the term post-secular following from Charles Taylor's work um, who like many sociologists and philosophers believe that modernity spelled the end of religion, but they were completely wrong. <laughs> Uh, there's, there's been uh, both the maintenance of religion and the resurgence of religion 
Um, and even in the so-called secular West, this has occurred, both in terms of fundamentalist revivalism and in terms of kind of like a synch synthesis and kind of like non-denominational quote unquote spirituality. On most surveys, people say they're spiritual, not religious, like in huge numbers. Um, uh, and so in conjunction with risk, the post-tragic, right? The changing questions about what it means to be human and the inevitability of facing the planetization of all the species, then we're drawn again to religious questions, fundamentally questions about of ultimate concern, as Paul Tillich would say. Mm -hmm. uh, and I like uh, Ken Wilber's uh, phrasing when he says something like, you know, in pre-modernity, uh, God was everywhere. Mm -hmm. In modernity, God was nowhere. In whatever comes next, <laughs> uh, God's everywhere again. Mm -hmm. um, and that's in a sense that notion of the post-secular and you can't, are, you, I would almost just assume say like the religious, the, the future of education is religious in some way. And if you're repulsed by the word religion, then that's not what I'm talking about, <laughs> right? Um, like it, it's, it's not a return to pre-modern religion. <laughs> it's an advancement. Um, we talk about a neo-perennialism or an evolving perennialism. Um, that's one way of thinking about what the generational transmission looks like. You have to boil it down to the most essential ingredients of wisdom that can be transmitted to the next generation. Even if you don't know the specifics of what their logistical positions will be, <laughs> there's guidance that can be given. And not just from us as elders, but from all of our ancestors. <laughs> uh, so there's this deep question about how to, as Habermas said, you know, make use of the untapped semantic potential still latent in, the, in religious language, right? The untapped semantic potential of religious languages. And he talked about that untapped semantic potential of religious languages, mostly being about how to protect vulnerable people and communities from exploitation. Mm -hmm. And those are the languages that we're missing, right? Capitalism has perfected the languages of disguising exploitation. Mm -hmm. uh, so what are the languages that expose and that protect the human, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and one of the best ways we <laughs> disguised exploitation was with the public schools. That's another conversation. Right. So the passing, the passing away of those, I think, is uh, is an event. So that's how I see the future. So those five are right, the planetary, the high tech, the risky, the post tragic, the post secular. Those constellate a certain future. Um, and it, it's going to be cosmo local specific, if I can say that, right, which is to say, there's not one answer to how this works for everybody in the future. There's only general design parameters, um, and kind of certain awarenesses that will characterize those educational systems that do succeed. Uh, and I don't know this, I don't, when people ask me what it looks like, I don't know, I have one model, which is an educational hub network model, which mm -hmm. I articulate in my second book. And we can speak to that and that works in some contexts um, but then there are other contexts where actually your best bet is to get pretty deep in the metaverse mm -hmm. and actually work from the inside of this technology to to, to change it um, because um, for some populations the digital is primordial mm -hmm. especially for the youth which means like you can take them to outward bound you can get them to the woods or you can you know try to disconnect them from their phones, but they know that the future involves the digital. Mm -hmm. And so they don't want to feel like they're going back in time. So there's a lot to say there about the fact that these same technologies that could become basically pathological propaganda spreading machines, those same technologies could become some of the most powerful educational things in the, I mean, humans have ever seen. Like mm -hmm. there are educational futures that are ridiculously positive. <laughs> Uh, and there are educational futures that are terrifyingly um, like unescapable from in terms of the, the potentials of virtual reality specifically for propaganda uh, and uh, propaganda delivery. You know, mm -hmm. So that's a whole <laughs> uh, other conversation. So that's kind of how I'm seeing it. Mm. it it's interesting because as you're speaking, in, I, I'm, I'm, getting the, the kind of demand on us as adults and the demand for maturity and maturity in relationship to mortality uh in relationship to respond to a deep 
kind of responsibility for life, uh, a, 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 uh, a real grappling with our, with, with, our, with existence, you know, the capacity to, to engage with existential questions in ways that are authentic and not bypassing or, uh, superficial. And, and that, that, that it calls on, it, it calls on us to be, uh, to pass through the tragic. And, uh, you know, you see so, so much of, so much of the spiritual world really kind of caught up in, in engaging in simply the tragic, um, and not recognizing the, I don't, the, I don't know, the, the groundedness in, in, uh, in, in mortality, in infinitude, and, and that that has a potential to open up to something that is, uh, that is, is, that is love. That it's, it's in, I, I see in what you're saying, like an incredible confrontation with, with who we have been and who we are um, in terms of, of, of our mortality, um, in, and, and a calling forward of, of, uh, that, a recognition of the preciousness of life that, that, that has been instrumentalized and, and thereby degraded in modern capitalist culture. But that, that, that degree of, of encounter and engagement with 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 the the rawness of life seems to be something that we cannot turn away from if we want to be if we want to have any authority as human beings in this in this time between worlds yeah yeah i mean that's you know this is it's interesting when you think about diversity of groups like i note the absence of youth here there are some young people there aren't any teenagers here yeah <laughs> Um, what's all adults here? Um, yeah. We age segregate society really radically. The public schools are insane in that sense. Like literally you just keep kids around kids of their same age, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and so that sense of, yeah, this is a conversation between adults. And so that means that actually there's a different kind of thing that we can say here about our unique roles and responsibilities. And frankly, the, the difficulty of facing the actual obligation of intergenerational transmission, mm -hmm. which is why we prefer, at least in the postmodern West, theories of parenting that abnegate us of responsibility mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and that uh, denegrate authority mm -hmm. uh, in general. Yeah, uh, I was of thinking there's... of that. I was yeah. thinking of that earlier that yeah. that when you even use the word authority, teacherly authority, yeah. it, our postmodern culture has a little bit of an allergy to that. Yes, of course. And if, but uh, and of course, and as they should, <laughs> right? There has been so much pathological authority, and there's been so yeah, much pathological yeah. teaching authority. But it's been parasitic. Those those pathological versions are parasitic on a core of human experience that can't be that can't be neglected, which mm -hmm. is the loving relationship between a student and a teacher. And that's mm -hmm. the key. Love is actually the key, and that's why the Thomas Jefferson avatar will never yeah, <laughs> be a teacher because you. Mm -hmm. If, as long as it, the simulation doesn't become completely insane, uh, there will be a sense of it's not a, it's not a person. I mean, Lewis Mumford wrote in like the 60s when this conversation was just beginning with cybernetics and Skinner boxes and other things. And he was basically saying like, uh, it'll never work because ultimately when you really have a teacher, not when you're in a bureauc bureaucratized relationship of like, oh, I have to call you a teacher, but I don't actually respect you or want to learn from you, but I have to by mandate of law, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is what happens in the public schools. When you're actually with a teacher, you love them. That's how you know that you can trust them to, mm -hmm. to learn from. And they should love you. Mm -hmm. And you're actually conspiring together mm -hmm. to obsolete the asymmetry between you, right? That's the key. Right? that the relationship of teacherly authority and how you know it's not perverse authority is that authority is legitimate when it actually, it seeks to use its power to bring you up to its level of authority, mm -hmm. right? It actually, if it's a true student teacher relationship, and again, different from the propagandist, 
propagandist has no intention of obsoleting the asymmetry of power and knowledge, period. The educator, by design, is trying to, right? They want you to, the educator wants you to reach their level of understanding and then surpass them. <laughs> uh, and you look at the same data, you look at the same texts, you look at the same experiences, you live in the same place together. The propagandist lives far away mm -hmm. in the metropolis and mm -hmm. guards the epistemological asymmetry from being breached by design. Uh, and a pathological teacher, spiritual teacher, whatever, will also guard that breach of authority and knowledge against there will be uh, secret teachings, right? Mm -hmm. There will be uh, empowerments that can never be attained. Uh, and there will be individual self, um, basically they will believe themselves to be fundamentally distinct, so much so that you could never attain <laughs> what they've attained. Uh, and then there's an, forever that asymmetry of authority, forever. Mm -hmm. Whereas the teacher says, hey, it may be difficult, <laughs> but you can totally get here. <laughs> Mm -hmm. totally get here and I'm completely committed to getting you here uh, and we've got other people around who will see if that happens or not um, it's, in, and, it's interesting and, yeah please I would mean, say it's it's interesting because I think about in my own life there were two teachers and I would say that they they represented a doorway to a to, to a very attractive future that I couldn't even understand but there was an opening that they created in in my life world space and uh, that's something that that a an AI Thomas Jefferson could never do. No, I mean, and that's that's right. Like to say you had two or three teachers, you're lucky mm -hmm. in, these, in this. Day very lucky. You're mm -hmm. very lucky because, as I said, even when there's the possibility for real love and teacherly relationship, let's say in a public school, uh, you're still in a public school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, you're in a sometimes a building that was designed with the same blueprints as a psych ward or a <laughs> prison, <laughs> uh, right? So you're in a modern institution, and so, like, um, you know that what's that song? Like you found love in a hopeless place. I think it's right. Yeah. Now, right? That's what it would be. So yeah. you'd have to find a way to to protect that. Right? Yeah. And I had a couple teachers in high school that were teachers. Like I was very yeah. lucky. Um, but it was, you know, it almost felt like illicit, like, mm -hmm. oh my God, I really actually care about this. And you really <laughs> want to teach me, like, we're not supposed to be actually doing this. Like we're actually engaging in education here. We're supposed to just be kind of playing the system so that I can succeed, you know, right. and not engaging in anything that actually really matters to me. What matters to me is getting into a good college. Right. Content right. To inst instrumentalize myself so that I can yeah, get self in. Yeah. Self-instrumentalization yeah. uh, is the name of the game and yeah. zero sum competitions right um again the insanity of the modern school is that every kid has a bullshit job yeah every kid just works for their own self-promotion right. and none of the problems they work on need to be solved right. period it's all made up busy work <laughs> uh problems that actually need to be solved they don't get to work on for years and years and years and years and years until they so-called graduate right? right um and that's nuts and again in pre-modernity you have the guilds right? And the guilds had places for like six-year-olds, 10-year-olds, yeah. right? Yeah. Now the guilds not, again, then capitalism came and they didn't change fast enough. And that's why we have child labor laws because then you have seven-year-olds in coal mines in England, <laughs> right? Uh, but the point being that the idea that kids need to feel like they're contributing to society is real. And mm -hmm. their awareness that this job is bullshit, the school is bullshit. Like I'm not helping anyone but yeah. myself here and you're forcing me into competition with my peers. Uh, so one of the things that the future of education evolves, and this is part of my education hub network thing, is a return of guild-like structures where you expand the range of relationships that young people are involved in, uh, in order to get them in situations of doing real work in their community that needs to be done under the supervision of real teachers and elders. Um, uh, and that's, I think, essential for the adolescent mental health crisis. Frankly, some Absolutely. of the adolescent mental health crisis is that they're just idling there as the world burns. Yeah. And we're literally like, no, you're yeah. not old enough to be responsible yet. You're literally not old enough to be responsible yet. Even though you want to be, you need to be, the world's burning. <laughs> right. uh, but we, by law, take them out of positions in order to be able to help. And that's why there's so much anger in their activism with the youth. Yeah. Um, because they actually know that they don't have power yet. Um, and uh, so it's 
it's a complicated situation. Yeah. I would like to, uh, we, we only have a couple of minutes before we're supposed to take a break. I would like to take the break later so that we have some, so that you have some chance to engage with, with Zach and we can continue this dialogue. Um, so let's see if we can, I think on the upper, uh, if we, on the upper right-hand corner of your, your screen, if you can switch to gallery mode so that we're all back together again. And that would be, yeah, that's great. Now, I, I would invite you to, to, to share, share something that struck you, share something that, 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 that really uh, touched you in, in, in what, what Zach has been saying. And let's see where we can go from that. And Zach, you can respond. It's it's like, but it'd be great to hear from from a number of you. I mean, we we've been going for a, for a while now, um, and it'd be good to hear hear what strikes you, confuses you, that something that you have a an authentic response to. And you can just open your you can just open your 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 your. Uh, Mike and, and speak, but Becky, you've written something. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so um, Zach, we have a connection point. I'm connected to Dr. Dawson as well. And so I've read your research and interact with her. Um, but I also have these moments where I interact with indigenous elders from around the world. And what is fascinating to me is that so many of these indigenous cultures have these stories and narratives that have been passed down that predicted this time period. And so what really struck me, Zach, was as you were talking about this intergenerational transmission, it is almost like it is embedded within these indigenous narratives uh, how this disruption happens and, and what to do about it. And we see a lot of the indigenous cultures coming together right now, um, trying to transmit their wisdom in ways that they never have before, mainly through the written word. I mean, mostly it was very narrative and we're seeing a lot of books now being written and, and uh, them getting kind of this, um, uh, uh, validation from previous ancestors that it is okay to begin transmitting the words in this way. So I just really found that quite fascinating, Zach, that I continue to hear these same narratives in these different types of spaces. So thank you. Great. Should I, I don't know if I should reply. I'm called to reply. But yeah, I don't go know ahead. If, if you're like called to reply, <laughs> reply. So thank you for that. And my best to Theo, of course. Um, and I mean, just simply, yes, I've had people reflect similar things to me. Um, you know, I've studied in religious traditions, but I haven't worked in, with indigenous elders. One of my colleagues, Tyson Munkaporta, who's from mm -hmm. Aboriginal culture, um, I've spoken with him at length and we completely agreed on almost <laughs> everything with completely different <laughs> backgrounds. So there, there is something. And it makes sense if, if there's anything that I'm saying that's true then it would by definition be discoverable. And I'm claiming something true that a very early human, like if it would have been known that this was the most precious thing, right? That the, that the task of intergenerational transmission is the most precious thing. Like that, that would have been a realization um, and it would have been preserved through story and other things. And that's one of the realizations we lost, I believe, um, as we became more complex technologically. We got kind of mystified by our own creations, created a second nature that now we don't understand. Um, and we've we lost that connection to the most precious. So yeah, thank you for that. And someone put uh, Tyson Yankaporta's book up on the chat, which is, yeah, he's, he's remarkable to engage with. You, you can just open your mic to speak. You don't need to raise your hand, but please speak. Yeah. Schooling, Elizabeth. <clears throat> Hello. That's, that's, that's the schooling. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I actually don't even know how to phrase this question. It's just trying to kind of, in some ways, 
uh, what was being said resonated as regards Heidegger's notion of technology. I'm mm. not even I'm, I'm not even sure if I understand Heidegger's notion in terms of he talks about technology being a mode of being, you know, and it's being unconcealing and revelational. So I suppose I, I try to try and kind of you know grapple with it in some kind of dialectical way, you know, in terms of his um, concerns. Now he was never you know, against technology, made that very explicit. Um, but there was this kind of revelational kind of, of being something, you know, in terms of our approach and our understanding and appreciating of what technology actually is. You know, um, just wonder if that is making any sense or if there's any threads to be developed in that. Um, I think Dreyfus's work as well you know, that followed on from Heidegger in terms of AI. I think there's a lot of depth in there. And these guys were onto something that seems to be very relevant um, for where we're at now. Yes, Dreyfus's work. I've read Heidegger. Uh, just haven't, it's just too complex. I haven't gotten into Heidegger, unfortunately. <laughs> but I know, of course, the, the, the definition of technology you're speaking to. <clears throat> a, a lot of what I'm working from is frankly just Marshall McLuhan. Um, who I think is probably the best theorist of the evolution of technology and the way our tools that have co-evolved with our nervous system specifically is essential to get that it's that the linear, deliberative, reflective, text-based culture mm -hmm. is like really old school <laughs> and that we electric television radio culture is just kind of fading and that this digital thing is coming and the digital thing is profoundly different uh, that it's uh fundamentally changing nervous systems and that's why one of the things disrupting intergenerational transmission is precisely that the kids minds are actually fundamentally different mm -hmm. than a mind raised with text or television mm -hmm. um and so that's very much dreyfus's point and the kind of like as a psychologist my orientations Fisher's dynamic skill theory, and he took from Dreyfus directly, the, the tact, like literally at the tactile level, and the, you know, the spatial field, and all of those things, uh, we are kind of embodied and co-evolving with mm -hmm. the technology, and it reveals for us new worlds, um, both inner and outer, is the McLuhan's point. So, so yeah, that story I think is key for educators. To, to realize. Um, and it allows us to say things like, you know, our brains have not fundamentally from a DNA level changed that much from many, 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 many hundreds of thousands of years ago. <clears throat> and yet as we co-evolve with these new technologies, we become very different, fundamentally different kinds of consciousnesses and peoples. Um, so yeah, I'm, I, uh, I like what you're saying. And I think it's essential for educators to get the the profundity of these technological changes. That's really interesting as well, just on Dreyfus and skill theory and the connection with Dre uh, with with um, with Fisher. I, yeah, I, I didn't realize there. that either. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, well. Mm -hmm. Colin. Merit. Hi, it's Merit. Um, I was really touched and you took the words out of something I wanted to express earlier today um, that said, <clears throat> what are the languages that protect the vulnerable from manipulation? Mm -hmm. um, you <clears throat> present stress, there aren't many young people on this call, but there also are rarely when I come into I do a lot of we space practice. Uh, there's rarely people of color on these calls. And I've worked as an educator in uh, <clears throat> several contexts in, in uh, schools, high poverty and you know, teach for all kind of, let's send the good white teachers into the poor schools kind of narrative myself. That's, that's where I'm coming from. So that, um, I don't know, really touched me because it does seem that uh, there's there's places where, you know, how do we get those teachers in the room, I guess, with us 
is is and 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 know how to uh, both protect and and expose to the world uh, the the children who are particularly vulnerable in, in high poverty areas. Um, there's obviously no simple answer to that question. Uh, one of the core dynamics underway in the digital is a kind of re-tribalization and hyper-polarization, which makes it actually harder and harder to bring people with differing views and backgrounds together. Uh, so that's one thing I'll say. The other thing I'll say is that until we fundamentally change the paradigm of schooling, everything else is just band-aids on something that was by design uh, contradictory, dialectically in tension with its own ideals. It was saying it was trying to help everybody, but it was systematically discriminating mm -hmm. by design, the schooling. Uh, and again, schools, if you create schools and create grades, you create failures. Yeah. We'll stop. Yeah. Right? It's, it's written into the code of schooling that people will fail. Yeah. Full stop. <laughs> like that's part of the paradigm of schooling, that there are failures. <laughs> uh, like it's built in there. And so until some of these really basic, yes, soft eugenics isn't, isn't far from it. And there's a whole story about that. John Taylor Gatto, like you can do the research on that, the Fabians. Um, and so, so yeah, that's, uh, that's intense, you know? And so I don't, I don't pretend to sit here as a white guy and know the answer to those questions, you know? But I do know that uh, the, the difficulties I've seen when I did research in inner city schools in the United States um, were not being remedied <laughs> by more technology, more money, uh, more programs. Like it, it, that was, it was in that context that I actually saw how broken the, the paradigm of, of schools was um, mm -hmm. and that it was actually doing this by design. Like that some of these kids' lives were being destroyed was like inevitably a part of the design of this institution, <laughs> which sounds extreme. But if you think about the way we structure our economic system, mm -hmm. there's winners who basically take as much as they want. And then there's losers who bar barely have enough. And that's how it's built. It's just built that way. Mm -hmm. And so that's another example of a system at a deep structural civilizational level that we have to think about finding ways to change. Um, and uh, so, yeah, again, it's not an answer. This is me reflecting on like, yes, <laughs> like the, the way that we protect the most vulnerable uh, itself has been co-opted, mm -hmm. right? Like we, the languages we use to try to protect the most vulnerable have become propaganda, mm -hmm. right? Social justice has become a term of propaganda. I wrote a book with the title that says social justice and educational measurement. <laughs> like I'm hundred percent talk about social justice all day as a meaningful, rich concept, mm -hmm. but it is used as a term of propaganda mm -hmm. uh, often, right? So this question of like those languages that we have that can protect the vulnerable, we need to actually find ways to really preserve them. And it's getting more and more difficult mm -hmm. with the, the intensity of the hyperpolarization uh, that comes in from the, computational propaganda. So that's just a yeah. few more reflections there. That's helpful. I, appreci I appreciate what uh, Madalena said also in the chat that, uh, that that a lot of these biases that you're speaking about and, and that are so so much a part of, uh, of, of the way that our culture plays out are being built into AI unconsciously sometimes, uh, sometimes not. But even the ones, even programs that are supposed to be neutral, are not, and uh, that's a uh, that that's another level of of replication that is that is uh, is a concern, a big concern. And please, just just jump in. Yeah, thank you so much for this wonderful dialogue. Um, something about the aspect of the pre-tragic, tragic, and post-tragic um, somehow reminded me of like a sort of pre-traumatic, traumatic stage, post-traumatic stage. 
And I kind of feel like there's something here that can be worked through on the emotional level and the emotional realm where in order to integrate the complexity and, and to integrate the tragedy to be post-tragic or post-traumatic uh, somehow is going to require the maturity, like it was said before, the maturity of being able to hold the complexity of the emotional realm. And I also feel like this somehow feeds into how to not be manipulated is do we even understand from where we are in our own lives, in our own relationships, in our own jobs and um, communities, the ways in which we might um, not be fully feeling our feelings or the ways in which we may not even be totally able to be present for the complexities that have happened in our own lives. I guess what I'm saying is we can start where we are and because we are in this, in this capitalist society that, that this structure is embedded with its um, problematic qualities. And as we sort of like wake up, we're gonna realize that many of us are participating in this structure, but we have to somehow like, you know, not stay stuck in the guilt about it and be able to move to a place where it's like, okay, how can I start to have a rippling effect of like the way I can take better responsibility for how I'm participating? Mm -hmm. So like a short example is I do voiceovers for a living. And for many years, I've done voiceovers for advertising. It's been a big part of my journey to slowly wake up and realizing like, oh, I'm transmitting my voice into this realm that I now see is a realm of propaganda. And I'm slowly having to take responsibility for how I wish to navigate that terrain and participate in it. And the, the new yeses and nos that I now have to make on a daily basis. And it changes me and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be changed. And so I guess I feel somehow um, we can all start with where we are just in our little universe of how we're participating in our lives. And the more we can hold our own tragedy, traumas and emotions, the more we're gonna be able to do it for another. And I see that having a rippling effect on, on what might be possible to navigate this, this shift that is required from, from the adults. And uh, yeah, I guess I, I appreciated Elizabeth, your, the way you brought love in, because I feel love is actually a great intelligence that can be so easily sort of dismissed and yet that it's truly a fundamental field that I think many of us are going to have to learn. Yeah, have to thanks, love Anna. Yeah, thank you. Maybe we can hit Jeff and Leonard really quickly to hear your, your comment. And then I think we need to move to a break so that we can have discussion groups. Um, yeah, thanks, Elizabeth. And Hannah, I'm kind of um, on the, I think, a similar wavelength. It kind of strikes me that particularly this thing about stepping into teacherly authority. I'm aware of the ways in which psychologically, emotionally, I don't wanna go there. So Zach, you're pointing out that it arises from a sense of my participation in a failure. Like what would I have to offer? I've got a, kids who are 22 and 26 and they will actually directly say, you guys fucked it up. And, and then I'm in this place like, hey, I got maps. And they're like, I'm not interested in your maps. You guys fucked it up. So what I can resonate with is hanging out in the tragic is an indulgence. Like, mm -hmm. like it's actually not, it's not okay from a sense of my responsibility to hang out in the tragic response to the moment. So it's kind of, a, it's, a, it's an arousing, destabilizing realization for me to realize, to get it that I don't have a choice except to get post-tragic so I can enact the, the teacherly authority that's actually mine. 
Great, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Leonard. Yeah, I have a question. Um, and it's um, yeah, kind of the question would be what is your advice, Zach, for young people, young meaning 16 to 26? So I'm 24 at the moment and I'm I'm writing a book uh, for young people at the moment who don't know what they want to do with their lives. And kind of a lot of points that came up are important. I think also the responsibility and kind of my argument would be that the responsibility or it's very important to really um, yeah, grow, grow as a human being or kind of in the metaphor of a tree, become a strong tree before you want to save the world. And I think it's a big problem that um, children or um, young people with 14 or so want to try to save the world and kind of um, yeah, uh, do not have enough attention for their, for their own education and maturation. Um, and so, and then there's this question for kind of, so I, I'm studying and I'm finishing my studies in education and I just go there and I just take my exams. So I don't really learn much there. I read your books or so, or I learn integral theory or do trauma work or go to vision quests or I don't know, but there's kind of this question, how, or is it possible to bring the education system or kind of also universities together with alternative education programs or realms that are um, growing at the moment? So, yeah. I'll quickly respond because I know we've got a, a break coming up. Uh, so a few things. In general, I don't, I don't give advice to young people, not specific advice. I don't give specific advice because the contexts are so diverse. People are in very different situations. So I generally don't have general advice, but here's some general advice. <laughs> uh, one is that young people need to learn about psychology and neuroscience and how digital technologies actually affect them. Because I think this is really, really important. There are incredible things that digital technologies allow people to do, but there are states that people get into as a result of digital technologies and long-term habits that are acquired <clears throat> that are akin to brain damage, just saying it flatly. So there's a dysregulation of attention specifically, and then a dysregulation of preference and desire, and then a dysregulation of identity, mm -hmm. which can all set in from overuse, misuse of digital technologies. And by the way, they're designed to be overused and misused, <laughs> which is one of the things that the youth need to realize. And this is, I think, the trick. You're being exploited. That's the message. Not you're being empowered and enabled, <laughs> which is the propaganda and advertising, but actually you're being exploited. And as soon as they get that- And damaged. And damaged, right? As soon as they get that, then I believe we could actually have a, a, a response from the youth, um, uh, as opposed to now they're being tricked by the digital overlords into thinking that the tools they're being provided are in their interests when they're not. The tools are being provided in the interests of the digital overlords who are harvesting your attention for profit and destabilizing, incapacitating the youth in particular. Uh, so that would be the general advice is <laughs> figure out what's in the palm of your hand um, and learn about your own awareness and how to regulate your own awareness and your own emotions and how to regulate your own emotions and how to speak with people, you know, long form contexts, um, how to solve problems collaboratively and how to resolve disagreements, right? Things of that nature, which you don't learn to do <laughs> on the internet. Uh, so, so that's, that's my number one piece of general advice. Um, and uh, that's just kind of like for sanity and health. And then once that's in place, then, then other things become possible. But actually, in, until sanity and health are in place, uh, other, it's hard to say, go to college or don't go to college, <laughs> right? Or dedicate yourself to reading books for three years and work a job. And then like, it's hard to give specific advice if I don't know that you can pay attention for more than five minutes. Right? If you can't pay attention for more than five minutes, it's a capabilities crisis on a societal scale. 
no one can pay attention for more than 10 minutes. <laughs> we'll all die. <laughs> right. And we're approaching that. We're like vectoring towards that, like ab absolute attention capture <laughs> uh, and absolute attention dysregulation. And mm -hmm. I'm saying all this about the youth, but us, us adults know, know it too. <laughs> right. right. We're addicted to these things too. Uh, and so it's, it's a real awareness that needs to dawn. Um, so that was probably more than I intended to say, but that's mm -hmm. my advice. Uh, I'd be very curious to read what you're writing. Like, I'm very curious actually what, what a slightly older person would tell a younger person. Like that's a fascinating project. So I don't know if my advice is helpful, but I'm, I'm curious about your project. I want to support it. Great. Great. Thanks Leonard. And I think we need to, we need to close this section of the, uh, of, of our, our session and I would suggest that we come back at five minutes after the hour, whatever the hour is, wherever you are. And, and then we'll go into small groups for 30 minutes. We cut them, we we'll have to make them a little shorter. And, uh, and then, then we'll come back together and, and, and integrate what's, what's happened in the small groups. Does that sound, is that a deal? Sound okay? All right, thank you. All right. <clears throat> uh, so that you have it and it's easy, easy to grasp. Okay. I'll also say it. Typing is not doing so well. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Here's the question that we'd like you to engage with. What is the maturity necessary to succeed in intergenerational transmission today in these times. I'll say it again. What is the maturity necessary to succeed in intergenerational transmission in these times? You got it? Okay. So now you'll break into groups, into small groups for 30 minutes, and then we'll come back and integrate. Have good dialogues. Yeah, enjoy. <laughs> Where did Zach go? There he is, okay. Okay, good to see you back. I hope that you had some rich conversation. And if, uh, if anyone, anyone would like to, to share something that they felt was, was uh, meaningful, um, interesting provocative in your in your conversations let's see if we can continue the conversation here we had a, <clears throat> an interesting discussion about different types of uh, maturity really um, that are needed for intergenerational transmission in this time and uh, 
this is a synthesis that I'm putting together on the back of what we discussed, but it seemed to be in two, you could almost divide them into two different types, um, which kind of go along the lines of the strong back open heart uh, dichotomy, where there's something about the kind of the authority, the assurity one has in oneself, on what one believes to be true and right, uh, one's own story, one's own lineage, connection with community. But then also this open heartedness, uh, this love, this broken heartedness even, mm -hmm. that comes with and through that post tragic. But there's something in that both of these feel important. Um, and everyone spoke to these in their different ways, but that's that's how I'm seeing it right now. And uh, I know Zach has the you have the you know the the three parts of the meta psychology: the ensoulment, the transcendent, and the development. And hmm. there is really something too that it's this this holistic maturity, um, a maturity of having gone through something, been brought down to earth, but is also moving forward because the intergenerational transmission we're talking about here is like how to live mm -hmm. really and in order to know how to live you have to have lived mm -hmm. and, uh, nice yeah so so that's what i'm what i'm left with open heart and and a strong assured back mm -hmm. someone someone else want to pick up on that Well, I think it's just a um, moving with it and going, pushing it a little further and asking Zach to perhaps comment a little bit more on the centrality of death, which we have in a, our Western paradigm um, pretty much mm -hmm. erased um, in this race to the bottom of profiteering. And I'm not even calling it capitalism anymore. I'm just calling it corruptalism, you know, <laughs> because that's really what we're describing. I mean, money is money, you know, whatever. Uh, but corruptalism is really what is incentivized, you know, in this sort of, I call it, you know, neurotypicality being synonymous with domination and ruthlessness, you know. Um, so then you also start pathologizing anything that doesn't operate according to that rail, which is an, a rail of active domination and predatory success that's rewarded. I mean, it's the wolf of Wall Street, boom, 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 you know. Um, so, I mean, death and the ones of us that are closest to it in terms of um, our understanding of composting, I would say, identitary structures that have been to some extent or great extent the lies that have sustained us in the past 30 years. And this is not just a mea culpa thing. It's a joyful, I think, in the Spinoza's term of um, that which increases your capacity to think and act. I mean, it's sort of a joyful abduction of exposing um, and having a better understanding of our conditions of bondage. So to that effect, and you mentioned how only crisis and catastrophe and whatever can sort of awaken that, I'm wondering whether some direction towards training and mutual aid, you know, would be a way of being prefigurative of something we're fairly sure is going to come it's mm -hmm. not an if it's a when and i'm not just talking about deep adaptation and all that but i'm, I'm saying like a minute man kind of you know mutual aid would at least allow for that discussion to take place and for competency on both sides because none of us have it you know um and i'll just finish with i was listening to uh, a zoom group with ukrainian um, colleagues, you know, at the March um, gathering. And one of the things this woman said, who was a university professor, was, listen, I'm not 
don't misunderstand me, I'm not advocating for war, but our society before this invasion was ruthlessly competitive, envious, rivalrous, corrupt, you name it. And overnight, I've literally seen cooperation just bubble up everywhere. And I'm not advocating, but I'm telling you guys, how can you find a way to tap into what is already here? Meaning we are capable of that. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, that's a, that's a point that uh, Tyson Yunkaporta often makes, that, that, uh, that in times of catastrophe, of crisis, whatever, humans respond in, in ways that are often, you know, out of the box or just unexpected. And that, that this is, is fundamentally who we are, but we don't, we, 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 we don't, that, that's the system that we're in does not promote that. The systems that we're that 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 we're in, but that 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 big, I think that's part of the big heartedness and 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 strong back that Alexander was was speaking about. It, it's it it is us. I don't know if you want to say something, Zach. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, the, as was already mentioned, the, the meta psychology has got the three domains of the psyche, right? There's development where you're growing and thinking and becoming more complex. And there's transcendence where you're controlling your consciousness and attaining mindfulness and emotional self-regulation. And there's insolment where you're confronting death, like full stop, <laughs> like insolment occurs as a result of awareness of finitude and the soul can't not imagine death, can't not live in relation to death. So the degree to which death is ignored and downplayed and the degree to which we numb ourselves against death is the degree to which we stop ourselves from basically like one of our basic rights as people, which is to deepen our souls, right? And so the open-heartedness and the broken-heartedness mm. fundamentally go together and that is essential to see that actually the, the more broken the heart is, the more open it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and the best way to break your heart is to take life seriously enough that when someone dies, it breaks your heart, mm -hmm. right? The courage to love, the courage to love is about risking a broken heart, mm -hmm. right? Nihilism and removing yourself from context of love allow you to protect your heart. Mm -hmm. You don't have to invest enough in the world at all. You can even say that like, Love's a social construction. Right? Mm -hmm. Love's a social construction. Ethics is a social construction. I don't need to invest in the world at all. I can protect my heart. It will never break. Mm -hmm. Right? Wrong move. <laughs> Wrong move. Like I actually need to deepen and have the courage to love, expecting the heart to be broken because mm -hmm. the person will die. Um, and of course, you can see how the if you're a salesman, like immortality is a pretty great product, <laughs> right? Like the ultimate advertising campaign is one for immortality. All advertising campaigns are basically a subclass of an advertising campaign for immortality, which tells you you're always gonna get better, you're always gonna improve, you're never gonna die, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the, you know, and propaganda does the same thing. It's worth mm -hmm. having. Um, so yeah, the kind of confrontation with death and, it, and there's no avoiding it, that's the thing. <laughs> like uh, to rephrase the thing I already said, like in pre-modernity, death was everywhere. In pre-modernity, death was everywhere. Your grandma would die in your house. People would die on the street. You would see people die, like literally not see dead people. You would see people die as a young person, frequently. <laughs> when it happened, you were there, right? In modernity, death was nowhere. Death was hidden. Death happened in hospitals, right? And it was pathological. Death is like treated like a pathological thing, just like pregnancy. <laughs> is treated as if it's a pathology when it's actually a completely natural part of life. And so again, I believe that after this phase on the other side of the time between worlds, death will be everywhere again. Um, and that's complex to say, in part because of the ubiquity of catastrophic risk and in part because of the re-blurring between the sacred and, and the profane, right? That we won't want death to be hidden from us after we've seen so much and weighed it through to the other side. We will re-embrace it. Um, and that's the depth of 
the broken heart, which is the true maturity that can allow for intergenerational transmission. Um, mm -hmm. There's that other saying that, you know, only the eyes that have cried can actually see. So similarly, you know, similarly, you have to have that capacity to see clearly what's actually occurring. And uh, it's funny because it's like, there's no scarcity of tragedy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, you think yeah. like, oh, this is a great personal development opportunity that only a privileged few get to have. But in fact, <laughs> tragedy, tragedy is everyone's. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Marx always thought that the bourgeois were the most alienated, right? Mm -hmm. He believed that the actual capitalist class were the most alienated. And this is why. Because if you have enough money, you get enough optionality, you can think that you can actually avoid tragedy. Mm -hmm. uh, you build a bunker, right? Or you invest in Google and you're trying to solve death, right? You're trying to solve death, yeah. uh, which is the Or same. you have billions of dollars, which you can't yeah. even possibly spend. <laughs> yeah. And so the immortality projects yeah. uh, that mask over death, um, uh, you know, have led us to where we are. So you're you're seeing it clearly. <laughs> and then this notion of training and mutual aid is also, I think, a wonderful idea. And it would come from that. Like it's when crises emerge, everyone's confronted with death again, right? Mm -hmm. But not everyone reacts the same way or reacts well <laughs> to being confronted with death. So it's really about giving people the capacity to not to to live outside of that fear and confusion when death when death shows up because um, what would it mean to really help someone in a situation of mutual aid when civilization was breaking down mm -hmm. it would mean basically like i'm willing to take your life as seriously as my own life uh, and kind of willing to be in a situation of peril mm -hmm. <laughs> you know uh, with you um and uh you know that's you know, it's love in a way <laughs> like so anyway now i'm just rambling but it's a great it's a great question so thank you for that yeah it's interesting in relationship to the chat that's 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 going on between rena and joy i think it it's uh that that we're in a system that 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 creates and perpetuates crisis at certain levels at, at certain levels that that keep escalating and are are now absolutely totally destructive but the the kind of dignity of living with death is not a crisis it's it's profoundly human and i think that that's uh that's part of part of i think what, what zach was just speaking about and also madalena also One of the things that was discussed in our groups was about um, right passage and how um, part of maturing has been in history through rites of passage. And it made me think like, you know, who the elders were, who the guides were, or who the shamans were that allowed for these initiations to take place and what kind of guides might we, um, might be here today and even guides within ourselves who might we be if we just were more honest in our transmissions and took responsibility for our transmissions that actually it may be within us that we're able to midwife different rites of passages for people maybe not in this like classic sense of like from beginning to end but we don't know how we're touching people just by being who we are. And that the more we're able to, to go into these depths in ourselves and take responsibility for how we participate in life, we may actually be midwifing other people's stages and, and steps in life. And we, we might not know that we're doing that, but I think we are having an effect already and we may be who we're looking for. That makes me think of the, yeah, I love that. That makes me think of the phrase, 
spiritual confidence. I read this one time and it really struck me. And that is the ability to take one step beyond what we currently think we're capable of. And what you just were speaking to makes me think of how we are probably more capable of, of embodying more of who we can be than we currently think we are. Like in some ways we're already, we're in the initiation, we're in this portal, we, we are, we are the ones we've been waiting for and yet we're we're still almost like afraid to really step into more of who we can be uh, alone and and also together and so it feels to me like an invitation i i have a, a, a i feel like i'm being initiated myself by my higher self and by my future self of like sherry you can embody more of your wisdom right now than you than you are and that you think you can and so i'm grateful for the feeling of the collective initiation thanks sherry someone want to join and and explore the maturity needed needed for being successful at intergenerational transmission? Something that struck you? I guess I'll um, just want to presence that our breakout group did spend a lot of time with different perspectives on embodied knowledge mm -hmm. as part of um, the, the what's needed mm -hmm. to mature is, which is more of a return to who we are just by nature and, and as nature, that the transmission, um, you know, somebody in our group was speaking to we're, we're always transmitting, like we're always in practice. Um, and so there is this, whether or not we are aware of it, um, we're, we're already enacting. <laughs> and um, so, so I guess the question in, in, to some extent is really, what is that awareness that we're bringing? to what already connects us by virtue of our existence in these living, breathing bodies in a more than human world in this super organism um, that, has, that has suffering. And what is our response ability with that? And how do we, in a sense, help each other um, bring this awareness to what it means to be in this body and how is this body transmitting? And, and part of our group also, I, I was bringing up that I have grown up um, in this body in a segregated society. So what the ways in which I'm informed by my body is very different from a segment of the population that enjoys um, a lot of structural protections, a lot of institutional protections and the relationship with an embodied experience, living in segregated neighborhoods and living in, you know, living with a lot of compounded inequality is, is a very different um, experience of what messages, you know, um, are being transmitted through, through the body. And so how is it that we can come together in, one world dialogue and, and experience more of this um, co-creation mm -hmm. that we are already living the fruits of. And I would say that these you know, mega crises that are man-made um, is just a it's, a, it's a symptom. It's, it's not the problem, but it's really a symptom of, of what has started you know, within ourselves that 
has has just kind of snowballed into many many variations of of, of a kind of separation so i guess i'll just you know come back around to humility <laughs> And mm -hmm. in, in learning, and I think somebody else in our group talked about deep listening. And so, so as far as part of the maturation process, it it is requiring a certain kind of practice and, and humility and listening. Thank you for that. Yeah, what I would like to add. For me, it, what is most present now is emotional maturity. So I think that comes also back to the student-teacher relationship. If, so I think this is a very important maturity, just, just the basic emotional maturity that relating to each other really and being able to relate emotionally and really create a re relationship. So that's what is most present for me now. I think this is that's very important. And and it's so basic in a sense. <laughs> yeah. And I mean I'll kind of end it there. Just want to respect everyone's time. They it is very basic, right? I believe. Like the body relationship, right? Things that humans have been doing for literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years. We kind of had to remember how to do again under completely new conditions. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so I think there's, there's been a lot of interesting things said here. Like I've been thinking about a lot of stuff as I listen to you all, all of you reflect. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, and I stand kind of like, you know, just came in from the field kind of barefoot. Like I don't have plans or answers, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm, I'm kind of just reflecting with you guys together about this common situation we find ourselves in. And so I really enjoyed the format to have as much call and response and to have you guys speaking. And, and so I'm, I'm thrilled. This was a lot of fun and I hope it was beneficial. And <clears throat> on my website, you can find my email. And I'm happy to hear from anybody uh, about this. So, thank Thanks, you. Zach. Yeah. I know you have. I know you have to go. You have a hard stop right now. So, um, maybe we can say thank you. Thank you very much. Hmm. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. Thanks. And for for the for the, for the rest of you, if if you want to stay and hang out here, you're welcome.